I would like to say something about the uh, optimism and the pessimism bit of it. A few words about that. The thing is that if we are not honest with ourselves about how, how bad things are, we are not going to set them up. Okay? Running away from a problem is no way of solving it. That's one thing. And I have to admit that in many places, sometimes somebody or the other asks, gets up and asks me, you know, can we hear something optimistic? You know, I have a standard reply for that also. You know, wh what you have on the one hand in society and the media and elsewhere is a kind of, on one hand, a fake optimism. Mm -hmm. You know, economy is growing at 9%. Poverty will be history in a decade. That kind of utter bilge. The you know, it's that kind of the ultimate optimist. The ultimate optimist was a guy who fell from the 50th story of a building. Each floor he passed on the way down, he said, so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> he, was not, he was not available for comment after. <laughs> so, now, between, now, so there is that, um, alt, that kind of fake optimism, as I call it, which everything is fine, things are booming, you know, it's a little bad right now, but you'll see how it will be transformed in a little bit. The other extreme, on the other hand, is cynical pessimism, that nothing's going to change, it's going to get worse, it's going to be terrible, it's going to... Actually, to me, both these positions achieve the same thing. They absolve you of your individual responsibility of doing something. Mm -hmm. If things are so good, why do I need to do anything? They're getting good. If things are so bad, what difference will it make if I do anything? They say in Mumbai, nothing will change for this, nothing will improve. I'm saying that between fake optimism and cynical pessimism is a territory called hope. I live there. I think hope is a very legitimate position to have. And I see in my interactions every day with ordinary people great signs and causes <coughs> for hope. Like from your, I guess at some point the land of your forebears, I see it in the largest gender justice anti-poverty movement in the world today with 4.2 million women who are members of that. It's called Kulumbashri. You may have heard of it. <coughs> you see that, you know there's reason for hope. They're, I mean, they're achieving things that are simply stunning. Um, the best thing that I have seen in gender justice in 25 years of re reporting, 26 now. So there are Causes for hope. I mean, I can show you something about those women on, online here. One of the things they're doing, by the way, they are landless women. They're not doing one thing. They're doing thousands of things, including nowadays on the highways of Kerala, a lot of the repaired garages for automobiles are run by Kurdish, by little groups of women. They are a federa federated kind of an organization. But the thing that impresses me most Kerala, as you know, is a 99.9% .9 cash crop state. Food crop doesn't grow anymore in Kerala. Nowhere has a trend been reversed, but in Kerala, Kurumbashi has brought food crop cultivation back to the villages. If there is any food crop cult uh, agriculture happening in the state of Kerala, it's coming from these women. And the way they are doing it is spectacular. Um, they're landless. How do they get the land? They form collectives called Sangha Krishis. They form collectives of women, landless women. They then negotiate and lease land. Sometimes that landowner may be sitting in the United States with his children or grandchildren. The land is lying fallow because they're waiting for 
the real estate value to go up before selling it. The women then approach them through the collector of the district or the sub-collector or the block development officer and say, while you're just hanging around in the US, why should this land lie back? Uh, it is something astonishing that hundreds of thousands of acres which were lying fallow have come back to paddy cultivation and, and after 37 years, migratory birds have returned to the fields. How do you quantify that in monetary terms that achievement? The birds are back. <coughs> My Siberian and other birds that haven't been there for 40, for four decades are back in the paddy fields because the insect life that sustains them, the um, vegetation that sustains them is back. The, the, uh, in this 4.2 million people, there's about 300,000 who are banded into these Krishna sang uh, Sangha Krishis. These are groups of 18 to 20 women and they have taken, they have left behind Debates on food security, food sovereignty, they are way ahead. They talk food justice. And how do they get into that principle? These 18, 20 women together put in their money and lease land, okay? The rules of cultivation, one, it's almost 100% food crop cultivation. Two, I mean, there may be an acre or two somewhere that someone's growing banana or something else, but it's basically food crop. In the process, some of Kerala's dead, unique <laughs> vegetables have returned. Three, what is the principle of distribution and market? And I think that is central to the understanding of food justice. Those 18 women or 20 women or 24 women, depending on how big the group is in the village, Obviously, they have families. The rule is that whatever you produce, whatever is produced by the collective, first, the demands of those 21 families must be met. Only then may you take surplus to the market. You cannot take surplus to the market until the needs of those 21 families and they're doing it, and it's become a success. It's met, it's had huge hostility, it's had big setbacks. But they seem to be able to fight their way through. They've made it, and the astonishing thing is, in such a polarized state, they've been able to pull together women from very different political backgrounds. Last year, there was an international seminar on poverty in Kovala, and they asked me to give a keynote address, I declined. I said I will interview the leaders of Kudumbashree on stage for the delegates. And the delegates refused to believe, that it was being translated for them, they refused to believe that such sophistication and thinking and answers were coming from village women, landless, poor, without the extraordinary, uh, without very great levels of education. So you have hope. The things these people have done, I mean the astonishing things they've done, in some of the most hostile tracts of the Idukki Hills, Adamalakuri, most isolated parts of South India, they've conducted. Today, by the way, in hundreds and hundreds of Kerala villages, theirs is the biggest bank deposit account. And they don't play the market. They only put their money in fixed deposits in public sector banks. It's also part of their rule. They, they won't touch the market. They go to market to sell. If you were having this conference, you were having your conference in any part of Kerala, they would immediately set up outside your conference Kurumbashree Cafe, where you could buy your food, your coffee, and they make arrangements with conference people. So the, it's not one activity, it's thousands of activities from auto, garage, mechanics, etc. You mentioned that there were opponents to this. I think difficulty who would oppose it. Begin with men. <laughs> uh, now I know what's high difficulty. <laughs> Does it surprise you, no? Does it surprise you? Okay. So that was one. 
Second was political in the sense, and this is actually one of their great areas of achievement. It's political in the sense when it was born under one formation. It was born under the left democratic front, LDF. So when the LDF gave way to the UDF, LDF is led by the CPIM, UDF by the Congress, there were very strong attempts to shut it down and create a parallel body called Janashri. It met with incredible resistance from women in the Congress. Because they found value in it, they had a sense of ownership in it. I think that politically those women have been brilliant. Yeah? I found, say, you take a district like Trisu, it's a left stronghold. I mean, every panchayat is left. Three years running, the best Kudumbashri activist of Trishu, elected by, is a congressman. Okay? So they've managed that. They've managed that. I asked, one of the questions I asked them on stage, I asked them two questions which might interest you guys. Every time I interview them, I ask them the same question. So who does the housework? <laughs> yeah? Ten years ago, they would say, don't ask us stupid questions. <laughs> yeah? I mean, these are Malayali women who talk. Okay, I mean, they, don't, they, they let you have it. And Malayali women are one of the more advanced in the country. Yeah, but they're very, very, yeah. they, they, they can be very abrasive as well. Okay, not just aggressive. <laughs> so they said, don't ask stupid questions. You know we do it. Uh, this time when I asked them the question, so they, they were waiting for me to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been in all their districts. So who does the housework? This time they said, half and half. <laughs> there were 30 of them, 35 of them on the stage, representing the regional re leadership. So I said, really, half and half? Ah, they said, yes. Then the second thing I asked them was, okay, uh, I said, I said, uh, Fatima B, you're a Muslim leader. Hmm? That woman next to you, your friend there, she is CPIU. You're at loggerheads politically. And I said that woman behind you, she is Kerala Congress. And that woman behind her is Congress. Now, aren't you guys quarreling all the time? She said, yes. So, so I said, okay, so how do you manage? She said, at the end of the day, we pull together because I know that tomorrow I've got to borrow a cup of sugar from her kitchen and she's going to ask me for two katoris of rice from mine. So we pull together because we have to. They managed that and they actually, they actually did that. I think, see, it is, um, it is not, and they get very irritated with you if you call them a self-help group. Because they, these are women of ex very great political sophistication. One of them told me, do you know what? Self-help, she told me, is a neoliberal philosophy. Yeah. She said self-help means you're on your own. You have to look out for yourself. We are a collective. We call them, they call themselves neighborhood group. Okay. She is there for me. I am there for her. We are a collective. We don't believe. And she's absolutely right. Just in case some of you didn't know, the word self-help originated with a neoliberal, with a Victorian conservative philosopher called Samuel Smiles, who created that phraseology of the ills of the world are because the working class are drunkards. That's the cause of poverty. By the way, these women have an extremely nuanced position on alcohol. They are for prohibition, but very regular, they're much more for regulated, you know, regulated presence of alcohol than for outright prohibition. Though they would love, I mean, they would not oppose it if there was outright prohibition, they'd support it. But in, in terms of what can be achieved. So Samuel Smiles wrote these essays on the ills of the poor in England in the mid 19th century, saying it was entirely the working class was entirely to blame for its own uh, miseries. And it was drink and this thing. And he created that self-help. In fact, he had an essay around with those words included. So they say we are not, we are not a self-help. We are a collective neighborhood group. They have three tires, and one of those 
is called CDS, the most grateful basic group, which is community development support. So their emphasis is on collective community. So there was hostility also from large sections of vested financial interests from different political parties in the villages because suddenly these women were taking up the contracts for things. They would lay the road in Edamalakuri, which is the most remote part of South India, wild elephant territory. Just I'll, I'll end this Kudumbashree thing with this thing. They did something while I was present which was unbelievable. Edamalakuri, if it, it, to reach it, you walk 18 kilometers through wild elephant territory. And you walk over four or five hills until, as I was, you're bloody exhausted. And there, is, there was no electricity, nothing, no channels, no nothing. The women took a decision. The women took a decision. They harnessed all the government programs. They took over. They won the panchayat election. They took over. So first, there is a large employment guarantee program in India, the largest employment program in the world, the Mahatma Gandhi <coughs> National Rural Employment Guarantee Program. Hundreds of millions of mandates each year. So what they did, first they passed a resolution. No, first, they passed a resolution that we are going to electrify the village and we are going to do it with solar panels. Hmm? With solar panels. Second, they got that resolution passed in the panchayat because they are the majority. Then, they linked the fetching of the solar panels with the Rural Employment Guarantee Program, saying that the porters who went and fetched it and came back would be paid for the Rural Employment Guarantee Program and would also get a salary from the panchayat. Then, uh, six months prior to this, they formed a porters union of women challenging the monopoly of the all-male headload porters union. So there was tension for three months in the panchayat because the women were much more efficient at getting things done and they were not drunk and so then so then they they broke the monopoly of the toriyai sangha toriyai sangha of the male they got the uh, and then they went as the porters and fetched from 25 kilometers away they fetched solar panels now please understand these are tribal women they'll be about four feet something. They weigh 38 to 45 kgs. Each one of them brought two solar panels on her head, which is 18 kgs, half the body weight. Okay, women who were 38, 39 kgs were carrying, you know, 18 to 20 kgs on their head. And they brought 245 solar panels, which is as many ohms as there are in the and walk through elephant jungle 25 kilometers without putting a scratch on a panel and electrified the village. So that's who they are. I mean, it's just amazing the kind of things they've done. I will not say that they have no problems. I think they have very serious problems. I think they have terrible difficulties ahead. But the hope comes from the fact that they're prepared to face up to them. That's why it's did, they, did they need a media strategy? And if so, what was their media strategy? Their media strategy, first, I mean, they despise the media. <laughs> you know, they say, we've got a membership of 4.2 million. Yeah. You guys write about some microfinance group in Bihar <laughs> with 80, 80 women and how it's transformed their lives. You know one of their new media strategies? They're planning on starting a television station. They say we've got an audience of 4.2 million. Okay, that's one. Second, they run, they, they, they write. They had a Kudumbashri, um, you know, writing competition. And the people wrote articles and essays and poems. The judges didn't know what to do because they received 200,000 entries. <laughs> And I'm about to stick my neck out 
and hold a photo competition for them. But some of the country's great photographers, like Dianita Singh, have said that they will come and she's India's number one. Dianita says she will come and judge. I don't know. I'm scared of how many photographs <laughs> we'll get and how we'll handle it. And by the way, we are also out. The People's Archive of Rural India, which I found there, is giving over. They have a huge project for covering India fully. And they are giving over the coverage, not to professional journalists who cover it. They are giving it over to the Kudumbashri women. You know how, in, as I said, they do thousands of things. You know, one of their income earning activities is very interesting. They have become the village photographer and videographers for weddings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they earn 20,000 rupees by shooting your wedding. Okay? They earn that, depending on how rich that person is, but 15, 20,000 rupees net they make out of a wedding. So a group of five women, basic training on video. And they go and shoot. The confidence, when I was starting Pari and I asked them, suppose I give you little flip camps and ask you, uh, you know, to make, keep an electronic diary. She looked at me, and said, what diary? We'll make documentaries. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I shut up. I mean, so. I'm curious, you mentioned that They were, they were journalists. No, I didn't say they don't need a media strategy. I said they despise they, 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 they despise the media because yeah. the media never gave them, until they became huge, never gave them any attention. And in fact, was very hostile, depending on which regime was in power. That also, they got caught in that. And there are lots of Kerala journalists who know Kudumbashri very well. Gauri Dasan Nair of the Hindu was one of the first to write about them. They do have that, but I'm saying any other country, had you had such a thing, more academics are working on Kudumbashri in the United States than in India. I mean, that should tell you something. There are more PhDs being done on them in the USA than in India. People are seeing something extraordinary in them. Sometimes I think it requires an outsider to to be able to, to appreciate it. You know, because otherwise others might take it for granted. There have been two, three Kerala journalists who have done great stuff on it. But again, there's not been that recognition in the media until now, an acceptance that this is something unique. So, you know, yesterday and this morning, I heard from a lot of you, basically, I guess they presented their audience and they said, look, India is the country that has the best Two things, rather. One is, two things. One is, I think that even where there is hopelessness, it is our job as reporters to do our job. Okay, I'll give you one section. The thing that I have worked on most in the last 15, 20 years is the farmer's suicides in India. You're going to find it very hard to find any hope. 
Does that mean you don't do the story? You do the story. You tell the story. <coughs> yes, I even in that, you're looking for hope. You're looking for people. And you find extraordinary people. I found it. I mean, I found it in some of the widows of the farmers who committed suicide. The amount of courage with which they continue and manage and try is exemplary. But it doesn't hold out hope for larger transformations of that problem. It doesn't. My point is that you have to report relentlessly, no matter how bad it is. And then if the mainstream media spaces are closing, you do it as an independent journalist? It, how it took us the... seven years to put that on the agenda. It took seven years to put farm suicides on the agenda. Finally, it was a decisive electoral issue in 2004. Mm. Chandra Babu Naidu was smashed because of that. S.M. Krishna lost his election because of that. In the five states where the farm suicides were highest, that's where the governments took a crash. Yes, Saina, uh, can you please uh, tell us something? Because we are trying to do the kind of things you are doing mm -hmm. in Bangladesh. And I'm increasingly finding it hard to uh, media houses to put money into this kind of project. Join the club. Uh, <laughs> no, no I'm, I'm seriously, I mean, how do, how do you handle, where is the money coming? Where do I get the money to do this kind of things? I haven't a clue. <laughs> you know, I have started a project that is costing the earth. Okay? We are, see, but we've made ourselves certain ethical protocols on how, on how we will do it. Hmm. Thirty-five. My. Every one of us has had individual, unique experiences and routes to, routes at arriving where they are. Mine tells me two things. One is the. Corporate media. Don't get don't get tangled with corporations and corporate power. I say this as one whose classmates include three senior CEOs of different corporations and who are still friends. But do not get sucked into corporatization of media. You're, you're doomed. Second is we stay away from government grants. Right? It's like See, in the rural reporting, one, one thing that I wanted to, uh, you know, rather zoom, zoomed in on, and I didn't do it justice, is that a lot of people imagine that rural reporting and is about NGO reporting. No. Forget intermediaries. Talk to people. Okay. By all means, if there are NGOs doing something great, talk to them. But don't make them the story. The story is, our motto is, everyday lives of everyday people. You'll not believe what richness there is when you move out of that cliched development reporting thing of civil society. I, I always, by the way, introduce myself and seminars on civil society as the representative of uncivil society. <laughs> Journalists were never supposed to be civil anyway. Okay. So, uh, and I don't know, it becomes a very, journalist talking to NGO becomes a very middle class, middle class, middle class, you know, old buddies network, fraternity. So that I'm saying is something that I wanted to say that break out of those areas, the NGOs use them. Don't glorify and romanticize them. Use their context if you, if you need to. But I, I actually work with people, I mean, I try getting directly to the people that I'm interested in, rather than through a organization. Sometimes there are organizations that do invaluable things. I utilize that. Your question about the money. Firstly, uh, I gave you an example yesterday. Yeah, no, yeah, I got your example. I'm saying 
first thing I want to say is about the money. Look at the media as a whole. Okay? I, I personally say, I mean I assert, the advertising revenue model is doomed. It's failing very badly. When the New York Times has to take a $1 billion loan from Carlos Slim, a Mexican billionaire, when the wa great hallowed Washington Post has been bought over <coughs> by Jeff Bezos of Amazon, hmm, I'm saying the print media world from which you and I emerged and stayed in for decades, that revenue model is doomed. So what I'm trying to tell you is, it isn't just us, they're going broke too. That's, that's one uh, thing, if it's of any satisfaction. You have to see that they are also suffering. <laughs> that's one thing. The second is, there is no really solid, proven revenue model on the net. Mm. Though there is about a trillion dollars worth of advertising going on, there is no concrete fireproof, firewall you know, thing. It's, it's difficult. It's not working. Does that? I still believe that you will have a print media, that you will have newspapers. But I, one of the things we don't ask, we ask about the advertising and stuff, and when you base yourself on ad revenue, you're asking for trouble. But one of the things we don't ask is, why the hell should people buy your newspaper when there's 20 of you saying exactly the same damn thing? Mm -hmm. huh? AP, Reuters, and uh, whoever else dominates 60% of your newspaper. Why do I have, why today, why today do I have to buy one of 25 Indian newspapers <coughs> that is into Modi worship? Hmm? I mean, a complete, and, or, why today, should I watch a bunch of TV channels that are locked in an Olympic contest of jigoism? Hmm? Completely <coughs> pathetic coverage. Why should anyone, why should the public go out and buy subscriptions to you, to your magazine, to your newspaper, unless you're giving them something very different and of value? I believe they will. One thing that Bengal has, the old Bengal, and other and Kerala has, they have a tradition of small journals, and these small journals can be and still can be very effective. Okay, they will not have gigantic circulation. Look, one of the most respected journals in India is Economic and Political Weekly. What circulation does it have? How many subscribers does it have? But there isn't a person who doesn't know Economic and Political Weekly and will not respect something that is being quoted from the EPW, even if it's crap. Okay. So I'm saying there is a place for small journals, small newspapers. There's also a space for someone who's bringing something different in value to the reader. Right now, tell me what is the, you know, what difference is the, the difference in the, how badly the editorials are written. That's about all that I see. There's nothing sadder than the Times of India trying to write a funny edit. But, I mean, it's really, it's really sad. And you have, on what position, on what position do these channels or newspapers, they have achieved a consensus on neoliberal economics, market growth, reforms, what they call reforms. Nobody is questioning this. Why should I buy your damn newspaper? You're not telling me something different. You're not telling me what's happening is devastating, which it is. It's killing millions of people, which it is. It's destroying millions of livelihoods, which it does. You're not giving me a different look. And I'll show you the proof of it. Hmm? When I went out to, when I first did my rural reporting grounds, which is now 25 years ago, full time, I'm talking about, 93, I went with a project like you are struggling with now, and was turned down by 20 editors. They said, not what our readers want. I asked Mr. Swaminathan Ayer, that time one of the editors of Times of India, when did you last meet your readers to make a claim on their 
when did you last meet? You get your re you 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 think you know what your readers want by hiring market research services and agencies to tell you what your readers are thinking. Yeah, it's nonsense. One thing I worked with a mad old editor in a tabloid called Blitz, mm -hmm. who every year in different parts of the country called readers conferences, and the readers our readers were like us. They were noisy, rude, boisterous. <laughs> they would come and abuse us at the conference. But we heard them, damn it. We had a bond with them. They, they stayed loyal to us. They, there would be a riot situation in one of those readers' conferences. They, you know, I have always expected that someone would throw something. <laughs> but mercifully, it never happened. But they, they threw a lot of abuse at them. The editor, your editors and your top, the guys who meet in that editorial meeting, how many of them have gone out and asked a reader, are you a reader of ours? Can I talk to you? What is it you like about our paper? What is it you detest? Where is your interaction with the reader? We had an open door policy in the Blitz office. Any reader could walk in at any time and meet somebody in the paper. We didn't even have a security system. We didn't. We really did. And therefore, we got smashed three times in two years by the Shiva Sena. <laughs> and, my, and partly because of me, I'm, I'm afraid, because of what I wrote about the Shiva Sena during the Babri Masjid, post Babri Masjid violence. It's an extreme right group in. Extreme right Hindu fundamentalist gang. My relationship with them has altered dramatically because of my coverage of the farmers' suicides. So now I'm a friend of the Marathi farmer. Now I'm on the front page, quoted approvingly, by guys who burnt my office. <laughs> so on a, uh, this is India, it happened. Right. Uh, what you said about corporate media, of course, is uh, general issue. But then since uh, most of us, most of you rather, work for corporate media. So did I, uh, 35 years. I'm wondering if uh, it is sort of uh, uh, painted too broadly. Because I mean, one of our former fellows from India, from uh, the Times of India, which is as corporate as you can get in India, right? Uh, he's a, he's a, a rural affairs uh, correspondent, award-winning, and so on. And he was explaining that uh, they don't have a rural affairs uh, correspondent. Well, uh, that's from his formal beat, but that's what he did. Um, uh, and uh, he was telling me that uh, despite the Times of India's reputation. Uh, he still managed now and then sure. to find spaces within sure. the system to do meaningful. I, I did my work in the Times of India. Right. The book appeared at first in the Times of India. So, so can can you? Uh, I'm saying the spaces are shrinking. Yes. But first thing, but where, where does one find? Are there strategies yeah. for finding those spaces? Because I'm guessing that not everyone here is suddenly going to become of a small grassroots journalism. Here. Yeah. You continue working for corporate media. So but 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 one thing. I mean, I'm saying the Times of India. The, the cutting edge rural reporting in India today is being done in the Times of India. It's being yeah. done by a journalist called Priyanka Kakurkar. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. It's being done by Priyanka Kakurkar. She has just won the Statesman Rural Reporting Prize. She's won every prize. And I'm very proud to say that I trained her. She was my student, same way Radha was. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but the Times has no rural reporting beat. And if somebody doing a story from rural India doesn't make him a rural affairs correspondent. There was no such, uh, between Priyanka and me, there was no such rural reporting effort. I was 95, 93, 94, 95, and Priyanka in the last two years. The Times is an interesting paper. And I'm saying there are, I said, I said that I work in the mainstream media. There is hope, there are spaces, but don't kid yourself that the spaces are expanding. You are like Shehrzade in the Thousand and One Nights. You're telling a different story and dance every night to keep your neck. Okay, so, so That's, okay. how do you do that? So how do you uh, at least preserve or exploit that little bit of space sure. to the maximum? How, how would you do that within the... There are issues on which you can, there are issues on which you can't. Now, in... 93-94, India had just won its first Miss World and Miss Universe contest. Yeah. 
and there was no space for anything else. <laughs> and that was the time I started my rural recording career. I went to editor after editor. I'd been a journalist 12 years. I had a standing and was flatly turned down by editors who knew me for 15, 20 years from my student days. We were told that readers don't want this. Okay? They were said, they were told readers don't want this. Okay, fine. Uh, then there was this whole phase of brave new world of neoliberalism. And what's her name? Aishwarya Rai and Sushmita Sen were the role models for Indian women. No? All 450 million of them at the time. And I remember Star News TV taking a program off air because of a comment I made about when I, they called me onto it and uh, didn't realize what I was going to do. It was the Miss World or Miss <coughs> Universe was on the front page, on the sports page, on the uh, and on every channel these two girls were there saying we want to do the same things as Mother Teresa. <laughs> so then I was on the panel and then this was the anchor said they want to do the same things as Mother Teresa. I said that the only way that's going to happen is for Mother Teresa to enter a beauty contest. <laughs> <laughs> and she better hurry up. Time's running out. <laughs> yeah? She better hurry up. I mean, time's running out. I mean, but anyway, that program aired once and then bet off the air. It just disappeared <laughs> because somebody pulled it. Yeah, it was insulting and in bad taste. So, yeah, better. We work. You have to, one, you, you've got to stay at it very, very stubbornly. The situation will arise. The political situation will arise. In that time, suddenly, malnourishment deaths began to come up. The Supreme Court of India ruled that every state will have a midday meal program. A number of things happened, and suddenly I was the only guy around available to tell them anything about it. Okay? So it's a, I have always told my students three things. When you want, especially the present generation, you have to be multi-skilled. You don't have the luxury of saying, I will be only a writer. You will be only unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so in, in my period, there was a transition phase when if you knew computers, if you knew something about computers and technology, you were invaluable because the editors didn't know a damn thing. I remember the general manager of the Times of India telling Daryl DeMonte and me when he got a new uh, Krishnamurti, when he got his new computer, he said, see, this is my, this is my uh, 486. This is my keyboard, and this is my rat. rat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, I mean, that's how the general manager of the world's largest English newspaper was. <laughs> so for a while, for a while, there were spaces for you to be in, invaluable by having technical expertise, or you could at least fool some of the people some of the time as I did, and make yourself invaluable. The other thing, the second thing that I tell, those who work with me, everything in the Times, in the Express, in the, in the, in the news agencies is a trade-off between you and your editors. I, what I told them in class, I said, when you enter your new job, if you get to do two stories you want to do, in return for eight stories that your editor wants, that's an honorable beginning. You make that three, seven, you're doing okay. You make that Four, six, you're doing bloody well. Five, five, you're a genius. Yeah? There's got to be that give and take. There are stories which are morally reprehensible, which you will not do, that don't do. Yeah? But don't, you are, you are playing games. You're looking for spaces. You're all the time opportunistically doing something. You know, so I, Radha once came to my house in tears because she was forced to cover Femina Miss this, India. So this is just the year after Aishwarya Rai won the thing. And yes. She was forced to cover Femina Miss India. And I, I said, what's wrong with that? I mean, I'll write the copy. Yeah. And I wrote some fun copy. Of course, it wouldn't go down in the Times of India. 
you know there was a thing miss lovely legs one one of the prizes okay yeah so can i just yeah. add to that on how we can increase uh, increase existing spaces don't fight with your editor so when i went to Osana, <laughs> i was devastated okay i didn't know i only wanted to follow in his footsteps fight with your editor but do it cleverly i'm ah, no, sorry yeah do it cleverly so when i i you uh, said i i didn't really say that i went in tears so i wanted to do this so the you know the trade off was so I, i was like okay i will do these beauty contest stories but can i go to dhule where the malnutrition deaths are happening and so it was so it was the same thing you get and i was a rookie reporter so you know i was doing this this beauty piece but it was almost like a reward you get to go to thule right. so you yeah. know so every so but there, two, there, two there are three other things you can do one is to manipulate what's happening to open spaces in your own newspaper mm. okay i mean one you have a terrific story it's not being used leak it somewhere else mm. leak it then they will suddenly come back to you and say hey you know yeah give us that story so that's when that's one way second is you have to be very alive to the political situation yeah so that you you've got to develop some domain expertise some area expertise some knowledge of something which others don't have in your publication when that situation arises you have to be ready to opportunistically grab it and make use of it and that time they will suddenly you know what happens elections are declared you are the only girl who knows that area right because you've studied that area you know everything they'll have to send you right if they don't want to make idiots of themselves because there they're locked in a competition there are a number of ways in which you play little games at expanding space and yes awards matter a lot yeah they do matter a lot especially if you were a freelancer for 13 14 years as i was your space so your space expands if you do good stories that win you an award your space expands immediately that's how my space expanded i know that it, there was a direct correlation between that but coming back again to him how we built something it also requires it also requires jerian that you got to have human beings for editors at least one among four or five has got to be you know uh, you see the no outside the control yeah that's what and it's no it's all not it's not just outside of my control it's firmly within somebody else's control you see with globalization the minimal qualification for being an editor and by the way i was trained first as an editor the minimum qualification for being an editor changed dramatically with the neoliberal period essentially it was that you ought to have had a frontal lobotomy and prove incapable of anything remotely approaching <laughs> an independent thought <laughs> and if you managed that for 5 years you were editor in chief okay. so, so in that you're looking for friendly natives in the world of editors i found them i found them there are lots of people who were reporters who became editors who don't agree with what's going on who are shackled by the system there are lots of editors who are generally i mean who are decent people who are doing a job and you know fighting they also see themselves as slipping something in so you have to also give them the excuse to slip in something that's that's another you have to give them the you know today is world audio visual heritage day and you have some ridiculous article vaguely connected with it but very important to you in content and in journalistic terms then you slip it in you need the i had friendly natives the newspaper allies allies with the management big bigger i mean daryl de monte was an editor dilip padgonka was an editor i was able to use that. i mean Yeah, but I was able to do that because when I was growing up as a journalist, I had editors who mattered. That was a very big, big difference. And you also got to understand the mind of a working editor, and how you. Now, if I was a, my a tabloid editor, he would say, "I would tell him I got the story." He'd say, "Get me the headline." He wanted to see how the headline looked on the fold. 
on, under the fold. I mean, that, that was it. That was the first thing he wanted before he read the damn story. But he, he got the idea that it was a good story. That's what he demanded. You have to understand the mind of the editor. Then you also make things happen in the content of your stories. You also make things happen by the kind of journalist. I'll tell you, I made two very big changes in the journalism I did. In 83-84, I did a tour of India's drought-affected districts. I came back, I wrote articles, and I won a couple of prizes, which I was so ashamed, I did not pick them up. I was too ashamed to pick them up. <coughs> Again, it happened at the time of the Mokara deaths. I won two prizes. You don't know about that. I didn't pick them up because it struck me, we all were winning prizes for covering the malnourishment deaths of children. Had we covered the malnourishment and not the death, the children would be alive. And that was the first big shift I made in journalism from covering events to covering processes. Yeah. It's far more challenging. It's far more difficult. I see drama in the sinking of a well in a village. Ask me about it. I'll tell you how. There is enormous drama in the sinking of a well. There is a gripping story to be told in the sinking of a well, which is otherwise just a statistic. What are the social implications of that well coming there? In which corner of the village? In which caste groups Basti has it come? All these are politically explosive, dramatic things. You have to be able to tell the story that way. That requires a second change in our journalism. I hate it when journalists, and the, I banned it completely in the People's Archive. I hate it when you guys go out there, all of us, not you. You've got 600 words. Tell the damn story instead of romancing yourself. You know, I felt like this and that. I don't give a damn how you felt. I don't give a rat's ass what you thought. You've gone there, get their quotes, get their voices. Let those people speak. Develop a journalism of allowing voice to those people. Now, typically how rural journalism was done hmm, till that time was, you go to a village, and first thing you do, you go and call on the collector. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? The local district official. The CEO of the district is called, the government CEO of the district is called collector. He used to be a revenue tax collector in the British media. We still call him. That I suppose it's good because many of them still collect a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so you go and, now, I, while I was disillusioned with myself, I was a formally trained, conservatively trained journalist in United News of India. Very, con not con conventionally trained journalist. All we do in conventional journalism, by the way, I'm sorry it's, if it offends, but I found conventional journalism is about the service of power. Yeah. All the quotations, all the, we give weightage to that collector. <coughs> that collector came to the district six weeks ago, what the hell does he know about the agriculture of that district? Huh? I think a farmer who has tilled that soil for 40 years knows a hell of a lot more about the agriculture than the collector who is a Dune school product huh? or came from Mayo school, public school, can't tell a cabbage from a cucumber and is going to give you a comment on agriculture in I changed that after my disaster coverage of 83-84. I changed that, that that farmer would get the weightage. And I don't believe in fake balance. If you say something stupid, I'll report you honestly and say, you said something stupid. Okay? Because otherwise I'm misleading my reader. I'm not being honest with the reader. You know, you know this, if she says the world is... Uh, spherical in shape, she says the world is uh, square in shape, so I should give both sides and say, actually it could be a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, two sides of a story, but God, friends, sometimes a story can have five sides. Why two sides? And sometimes reality can be very one-sided. Yeah. Okay? Facts and reality can be very one-sided, they can be very multi-sided. 
journalism is a subjective art, which we, we speak of objectivity because we are trying to get subjectivity under control. Hmm? And I, so I think that first change was to start not giving authority the final word in every article. That I abandoned. When I came back in 83, 84 from covering the drought areas, and I was, I had experienced such power and it didn't show in the writing. It showed to those giving prizes, it didn't show to me. Because I said, I have experienced something phenomenal and because my writing was still, Prime Minister said here today. It gave weightage entirely to, the last word is given to authority. That has got to Increase the voices of, you know what else happens when you increase the voices of people? It becomes unbelievably more readable. In that idiom, in that colloquial language, in that, uh, you know, I'm stopping at a, I'm stopping at a place and asking the guy, hmm, how far is it to that village? He says in Hindi, he thinks, he says, do bidi tak. <laughs> he says, it's two cigarette puffs, it's two cigarettes away from here. By the time you have smoked two cigarettes, you, the time you take to smoke two now tell me how much more colorful that is than my saying it was two kilometers away. It's so much more readable. The reader looks at that he wants to read further. And it sounds beautiful in Hindi. Do bidi tak. Two bidis. Bidis are country cigarettes. Do bidi tak. That's how far off it is. Use the language, idiom, bring that in. You know, in BBC in the 60s and 70s, was seriously, severely challenged by offshore pirate radio stations. It damaged the Brits so much, they sent out the Navy and sank those pirate radio stations. There's a whole film on it now. Okay. I knew some of the pirates. They were young youth from Liverpool, from Brixton. They were refusing to take this Oxbridge kind of, you know, today India will be considerably hotter. You know, <coughs> they, they kept all that crap out. They spoke in their Cockney accents, in their Welsh sing song, and they drew millions of listeners away from the BBC. After they were crushed, the BBC adopted all their styles. It brought on Cockney voices, it brought on Welsh voices, it stole. And one of the things that we are going to do as journalists trying to do alternatives within mainstream journalism, I don't ask you to form ghettos. I consider myself a mainstream journalist. I write in the mainstream level now. Is to influence that mainstream journalism. When in the Times of India we ran on the 84 stories at a, at a shot, how did that happen? The, no editor was willing to carry it by some accident you know, these things happen. I won the Times of India Fellowship in the name of their founder. And the founder's son, who was Ashok Jain, owner of the paper, was very fond of daddy. So I had to be given some space in the paper. They thought that they would carry six pieces or so. They agreed six to ten pieces. From when the piece started appearing, that was the time of great public disgust with the media, with Miss Universe, with Miss World, with this stuff. Suddenly, something different and serious appeared there. They had the highest number of letters from readers in their existence, barring after the assassination of Gandhi. Okay? So they were getting that feedback that they were asking me not to stop. At the end of 84 pieces, I pulled out because I wanted to do another thing. I wanted to write on caste and Dalits. So I moved to the Hindu to write about that. But they were asking me not to stop. I, could, I was offered the position unlimited to go on doing whatever I was doing. Because that's where it is. It will happen when your readers come in on your side. Okay? Keeping your, taking your reader very seriously. Giving them something different. Like I said, why newspapers are failing. What do they give the reader that the reader, that I respect you so much that I will keep your paper alive? Why? What are you telling me different about IPL? What are you telling me different about Modi? Hmm? 
we had for the first time in our history, and not one editorial, not one editorial, for the first time in our history, we had a prime minister peddling products for a corporate. Reliance Geo, you heard of Geo, the 4G. Hmm? Reliance Geo, front page ads with Modi on the front page. We are fulfilling our prime minister's technological vision, and the prime minister of India is used to sell mobile phone, uh, to, to sell a mobile network package. 4G. Geo. I, my immediate response online was Geo Hindi, the new national salutation. Jai Hind is passive. So Geo Hindi. You, not one newspaper wrote, that is the extent of their compromise with the corporate sector. Because he is the biggest advertiser. Express did not get the ad, so they, <laughs> they kept quiet. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify to you guys because on Sainan's comment on objectivity, right? Because when he first said it two, two nights ago to me, it was been in mainstream media that objectivity is uh, is overrated. Um, you know, I was shocked. But I think what, what he means, and what he means is you will have a right of reply in the story. I mean, if, if you don't have the other side of the story, your editor will probably not carry it. But you are the one writing the story. So, so you know, the balance, that fine balance, you can still try to control where you can. And the other point is, which again happens to me a lot, the spaces have seemed to uh, have shrunk, but Priyanka Kapoorkar is still winning, winning rural reporting stories and, reporting and, for the Times of India. And right? that's opening is, up the spaces more. And that is opening up the spaces more. Second, so very, second yeah. thing. Uh, two things, and I want to come to the objectivity bit, okay, okay. because it's a bugbear. <laughs> the, what's happening for Priyanka is also means when the big paper like the Times is giving her more space, other, other space. newspapers yes. start giving more space. Yes. Yes. Other newspapers, it happened when I started writing in the Times, and that was a success, that uh, the, the uh, column, the statesman <coughs> gave half the back page to a similar column. That opens up spaces for others also if you do it. I'm saying there are a number of ways in which you can push the envelope. However, I will bring one caution. That was in a slightly different period when the corporatization was not so advanced as it is today. But the spaces are fewer. <coughs> but I will put it very simply. The spaces are shrinking, but we do not we do not utilize the existing spaces. We don't. We don't. We are not fast on the, we are not quick on the trigger, we are not fast on the ball. We are not utilizing even those existing spaces. The objectivity thing, let me clarify. I believe in a particular kind of objectivity. See, there are, there are, um, there are three, in my opinion, three kinds of objectivity. One is the objectivity of the physical sciences, which is laboratory based, verification. Now, I believe the objectivity of the pure sciences is highly desirable, but not replicable. I believe journalism, by the way, I believe journalism at its heart is a discipline of verification. <coughs> It is a discipline of verification. You bloody well, you know, I told them two things, two rules 25 years ago. I said, two rules, follow the money, check it out. These were two principles of your reporting. Now, one is the objectivity of the pure sciences. There's something to be learned from there. The second is the doctrine of objectivity handed down from North American journalism schools. I wonder if you guys know the origin of this doctor. Please read the greatest book written in the 25 years, last 25 years of the 20th century on media. It's Ben Bekdikian's Media Monopoly. Ben Bekdikian was the guy who broke the story of the Pentagon Papers. He was the national editor of the Washington Post. He ran the Ellsberg Papers. He ran the Vietnam War Papers. He ran the Kissinger Transcript. He broke stories. He was an editor, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, though that's not a great qualification at all. <laughs> and uh, if you consider the Tom Friedman one three. <laughs> but Ben Dickens was one of the few journalists who made the transition to an academic. He became the 
Dean of Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism, Berkeley. Beg Dickian has a brilliant chapter in the original first edition. It's called Dr. Brandon Goes to Harvard. Dr. Brandon, in the late 19th century, was a quack who produced a lot of placebo, uh, placebo cures for everything from acne to cancer. Hmm. And he would advertise in newspapers and make a fortune of it. Two enterprising reporters started um, scrutinizing those claims. By the way, my hero in journalism, just so you know it, was a kid, unidentified, unmet kid, who said, the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> yeah? The emperor's nakedness was in the public domain, but it still required someone to say it, to make it sayable. Right? And that kid said, the emperor is Tartar's first great reporter. <laughs> It shows the report. Yeah, first expose. So then you have Brandon. These two reporters exposed the hell out of Dr. Brandon. He had no medical degree, nothing. He was just a quack. He pulled his ads from those news from that newspaper. The newspaper took a giant hit because he was the big advertiser. Then he pulled his ads from other newspapers where they were planning to put reporters on. Then a conference was held of editors, proprietors, branded, and co. And this, by the way, is how your right of reply came into being. And I'm for the right of reply, but I'm just telling you historically, this objectivity was molded, that doctrine was molded in this furnace, and it is from that doctrine that for the next hundred years, big tobacco was allowed to kill hundreds of millions of human beings. And every time a story was made linking tobacco to cancer, experts would give equal space to the tobacco lobbies, paid poodle scientists, to say there is no link established between cancer and nicotine. That's how that doctrine, now I'm not saying that the doctrine of objectivity has no that have been, Bagdikian himself followed a very strict objectivity. Hmm. Uh, no. But it was driven by advertising power and one of the founders of Chuck Blore, a Chuck Blore agency, which was the fourth largest advertising agency just 40 years ago, gave the best one-line definition of advertising that I've ever heard. They said, advertising is the art it is the art of paralyzing the human intelligence just long enough to extract money from it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that, 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 that really describes that discipline very well. However, he did, uh, so the, then when that doctrine came out of that, and it always meant giving equal space to big tobacco, to its paid scientists, and to the victims, and to the researchers who found the links between nicotine and cancer. So this doctrine of objectivity, by the way, completely goes out of the window where powerful interests are not involved. Tell me today, how, how objective was the American media in its coverage of the Iraq war, mm -hmm. huh? where the New York Times pimped for war through Judith Miller's articles on the front, uh, re reports on the front page of a football-sized stadium a uh, football stadium sized thing, uh, Je Gold, Je uh, Goldberg wrote in the New Yorker, weapons of mass destruction that never existed. What right of reply was there to Osama or Saddam or Gaddafi? Yeah. Where, where did all these doctrines go? That's absolute bull crap. It's a very selective application of doctrine. That is the doctrine of objectivity. The third is your the third form of objectivity, which I deeply believe in, is your personal honesty to the subject that you are dealing with. Your pers you know, you see, every one of us has different paths to evolution, of evolution. If I ask um, Radha to write on something and her counterpart in the United States to write on something, they may both be fine journalists and will come up with entirely different pieces. Okay. 
I think the first thing about objectivity is to recognize that we are, by definition, subjective. Then you can start being objective. The pretense that the journalist is some sort of zombie, you know, who's neither here walking a tightrope, or the, you know, the amount of self-romanticization that journalists do of, them, of their kind is something terrible. It's obnoxious. You know, you know what we are. <laughs> so stop pretending. So the your personal honesty in dealing with that subject. If you know that, and yes, I want right of reply, I would not find a story interesting if I did not have, you know, like if, when I'm doing stories on peasant struggles in the countryside of India, I find that the greatest quotes come from the landlords, honestly. You know, the, the best quotes come from there. The most murderous landlord of Bihar of all time made the most unbelievable copy. And he was, I mean, he had me floored repeatedly because he understood journalists. You know, he was a very fearsome old feudal who kept a little cheetah to terrorize on his, yeah, and it walked around with him wherever he went and he terrorized the villages. Then of course there were, so when I finally met him, this was many years after his cheetah days. And I was take, I said, okay, first I want to take photographs before the light fades. This guy has killed more than, you know, a few hundred people. And he was so media smart. When I started taking photos, he said, get my right profile. I look more evil from that side. And that's what your magazine wants. Yeah. yeah. He said, the last guys who came before you, they, they took my benign side and then they went and touched it up. I don't like that. <laughs> you know? So just take my right profile, you'll get what you want. Then I asked him, is it true that you had a tiger or a lion or something, which was what the story was on your... He said, in beautiful, beautiful uh, Bhojpuri, he said, Janab, I had a humble cheetah. Journalists like you gave it a double promotion and made it a tiger. <laughs> okay. I'm saying you have to get those quotes. You have to get those people. I believe in right of reply, but I don't believe in equal weightage to truth and nonsense. That is ridiculous. I don't believe in equal weightage. I don't believe that because A said something sensible, and B has a right to counter him and say something stupid. Okay, quote B saying something stupid. That's good for your copy. <coughs> but do not legitimize what you know to be untrue and wrong. That is bad journalism. So that personal honesty, that is the third kind of objectivity. And